Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Take a deep breath. Today, we are going to the highest permanent settlement on Earth. This is La Rinconada in Peru, wedged up against the Bolivian border in the far south, south southeast of Peru. It's virtually an unknown place, but it is home to somewhere between 10 and 40,000 people, depending on what you read. Uh, there is no tourism whatsoever to the area. I do apologize for the grainy photos. I went there in 2014, and I've been meaning to do a presentation ever since. These two nice miners let me take a photo of them. But the story of La Rinconada is a complicated one and really goes all the way back to the colonial period. Uh, Peru's foundation was all about extracting wealth from high in the Andes and taking it off to Europe. You might have read about Potosi, which was, I argue, the most important city in the world for 500 years. So here's Peru. It's a huge country, has the long, very arid coastline. And then the high, high Andes, two big ranges, but of course famously up around Cusco. And then the entire Amazon basin, that giant green area. But you'll see Lake Titicaca down in the south. Of course, that's a closed watershed unto itself. And we're moving into the high plateau that's up behind Titicaca. So it's quite a unique area. And it's very close to famous tourist areas. It's just not that often visited uh, for many reasons, including at least a perception of safety. Now, you would fly into Lima, of course, if you're going to Peru. There is Paddington Bear, so we'll see the British go and get a photo with him. That's right by Larco Mar, overlooking the cliffs in Lima. Lima has a grey sky about 10 months of the year. But then people often fly up to beautiful Cusco, which is really the centre of high Andean culture. It was, of course, the Inca capital, and their main language is Quechua. Of course, most people speak Spanish as well. But Cusco is, of course, dramatically beautiful, and it's the gateway for Machu Picchu, one of the, the most famous sites anywhere in the world. It's also considered a high-altitude city, 3,300 metres above sea level. It's about 11,000 feet, so still way up there. Uh, I have many photos from up at, at this view, looking down towards Cusco, and it's a place that uh, people fall in love with, um, and, uh, and deservedly so. So if we were in Lima, travelling to La Rinconada, right down at the border of, uh, of Bolivia, is uh, probably easiest done by flying up to Juliaca, actually, Puno, and then you drive around for several hours still. Over the road, it would be about 24 hours. If you come out of Cusco, you drive in. This is the border between Cusco and Puno, so famous photo at La Raya. And the glacier one sees up there is actually one of the headwaters of the Amazon River. And there is mighty Lake Titicaca. I'm actually on one of the islands, out in the middle of the lake there. Uh, very little filtration from the sun, of course, so it's a powerful, powerful sun. But I'm looking towards the eastern side of the lake. The lake is split two-thirds in Peru, one-third in Bolivia, roughly. And, uh, and it is, say, a closed sort of figure-eight ecosystem, which is probably worth another whole presentation unto itself, often called the highest navigable lake in the world, although that apparently is not entirely true. But it is high. It's at about 3,800 meters, so that's a, a substantial way up. And it is gradually evaporating as well. So there's Puno, and if you look up, it's got a circle up at the top. That's Ananea, and that's the area around La Rinconada, and there's La Paz, Bolivia, over to the side. Um, the reason I point it out is, for the longest time, Rinconada didn't even show up on maps, even though, again, it's home to thousands of people. So it's a unique environment. It's above the tree line, a high plateau, which is very attractive. Um, it's, uh, it's a fairly easy drive. Juliac is a, a disappointing city, but around there, then you move, of course. Well, really from the plateau, this photo I did take uh, by Colca Canyon, but just see the gorgeous condors and get a sense of the wildlife. But the plateau itself is basically treeless. It is cold consistently and, of course, extremely high up. And you will see glaciated mountains in the distance. That's the border with Bolivia. Um, beautiful, beautiful driving, volcanic rock. But very quickly, the landscape starts to expose the reality of what life is like in a, in a random and distant mining camp with very, very few facilities. A small population, well, a distant population, uh, I suppose shockingly large given there is so little infrastructure. So have a look at these alpacas. There they are living off the trash that is strewn all over the valleys around Rinconada. So that is the welcome to the valley. I remember I was actually driving and when driving up there, we were stopped by the police and, uh, and asked what we were doing and concocted a story that we were climbers coming to high altitude. Um, people were incredibly welcoming, is the reality. 
but uh, but of course there's a perception because the mining is informal, i.e. illegal, um, different attitudes. And there is the mighty glacier that they mine under. Uh, it has been called the White Hell, and I think that's an appropriate name. They mine in, can you already imagine, at 5,000 meters, 16 and a half thousand feet, then climbing into deep caves. Traditionally, people would work 28 days for free, and then they would have one day where they could extract as much mineral in hopes of finding some gold for themselves. To what extent it is still operating that way is hard to say. Certainly, there's a lot of talk about people being trafficked. Uh, people come from all over, but the dominant language is Quechua, although Aymara is spoken. There's a gentleman sitting at the central plaza. He is chewing on coca leaves, which, of course, is just endemic to anyone living in the high altitude. Uh, there's a long story about coca leaves, but uh, they're not, of course, to turn coca leaves into to cocaine. It's such a randomly unrelated story. It's almost not worth discussing, but it does mitigate hunger, which then helps deal with the altitude because if you're not busy digesting, uh, you're absorbing air more easily. That seems to be the relationship between coca leaves and, uh, and high altitude living. But uh, upon arriving there, saw this incredible scene immediately of these three women digging around in old mine tillings. What they're doing is grabbing these rocks, anything that shows some line of ore to it, then they mix it. And what do they mix it with? Mercury. And they're tumbled over and the tiny bits of gold would bond with the mercury. For a gram, they're maybe earning about $40. They would hope to maybe find two or three grams in a day. And these ladies were incredibly friendly and welcoming, but they certainly didn't stop digging away. And you literally earn enough money to survive for that evening. This is true of mining society the world over. It does show, though, a reality that I have certainly seen in, in Quechua culture, in the high altitude Andean culture, that uh, women, well, as the world over, take on so much of the labor. But there is also a certain quality to, to life at high altitude up there, um, at least in terms of the ability to earn a living. So once you find your tiny bit of uh, gold, then you take it to one of these gold purchasing shops where they cook off the mercury, and that just ends up in the air and the water system, which obviously has lots of long-term effects. And it's melted down and weighed, and they will know the spot price for gold in New York, in London, Madrid, or wherever at that moment, and people will be paid in cash. And so on the drive up to and back from La Rinconada, there are loads of security vehicles traveling, presumably with gold. As to where it goes is a big, broad question. And in fact, when we talk about mining in Peru, down in the Amazon region, uh, Puerto Maldonado, for example, there is just informal, i.e. illegal mining throughout the area. And it does mean all the other resources are not being extracted. And it brings us to this point that really Rinconada is pretty close to lawless. There's a view of the community itself, um, just the streets with trash going down, public toilets you'd pay for. I remember going over while driving there, a bridge on the way up to the community, and you would pay one fee to drive over the bridge and pay another fee to drive over the bridge and not get a receipt. <laughs> so, but this sign up here is simply saying, United Neighbors, Public Justice. In fact, it says Massacre and Public Justice for Criminals. So this is how they approach uh, the reality of crime in a community that is, say, effectively lawless. But you also see some real infrastructure. You know, these are legitimate buildings in a place that gets extremely cold. Now imagine medieval times. There is open sewage running down the middle of the road. Brings us back to the classic concept of winter culture. Uh, the fact that it does get below freezing at night, simply because of the altitude. I mean, you're actually located within the tropics, technically. But uh, but that would freeze up and some of the smells would go away. Um, now, nighttime entertainment is just as challenging. The gentleman on my right there was actually my sort of bodyguard. And, of course, they've got these nightclubs and it's, it's prostitution. Uh, I've read stories about women being trafficked. Um, I don't know enough. I didn't go into any of these places, but uh, they were very interested to see us walking down the street. But as soon as I pulled out a camera, everyone turned around. And obviously, I didn't want to pursue any of that. But as I say, I found just kind, warm people, which is the reality whenever I'm in the highlands. They, uh, they are a, I think it's fair to say, quite a, an introverted culture and lack um, a, a, a significant amount of trust for anything that feels in, uh, institutional. And that's understandable. This is the central plaza of La Rinconada. 
So it's a main square. There are actually restaurants and services. And of course, everything has to be brought from a fair distance, usually from Juliaca, which is a very peculiar city if you've ever been there. People usually go through Juliaca to get to Puno and the famous loading islands. And then we stopped at a little mining camp just outside town, and that's where I met this young man here. That was actually home, and they had a pit of water. Of course, you always need water for mining, or virtually always, and, uh, and it was just toxic. And he was obviously not going to school, uh, but I met his father. He was a kind young man. Might even, I know it's a bit of a grainy photo, but my cheek looks swollen. That's because I'm chewing coca leaves as well. But there you go. There's home in the Highlands. And while many of these people are Highlanders, I did meet uh, one miner, for example, that I chatted with, who, um, who came from Trujillo. It's down at the coast, so his body would have had to really adjust to this altitude. And there I am looking a little disheveled at high altitude myself. Now, I was already acclimatized to Cusco, but this was a whole different game. Um, from here, you can drive down into the Amazon, into the middle of nowhere where the cocoa production is. And in the evening, trucks coming up from Brazil, I guess, contraband. Uh, and then the daytime, nothing whatsoever, but terraces that go back, well, thousands of years. Anyway, this is just a small introduction to a place that has fascinated me for years. And this is La Rinconada, Peru. Thank you for connecting.